Come on, Nicole. So many buttons. Press them quickly. Press all the <laughs> buttons. Did it. That's a little high. More of my ferocious beard. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, June 14th, 2013. So joining us this week, we've got a couple of new, no, one new face. So we've got Sandy Springman from the Arecibo Observatory. Sandy. Um, we've got Amy Shearer Title. Hello. Space and back and feeling better in your new facility with no furniture. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations on making your uh, epic move to the East Coast. Yeah, thanks. Big drive. <laughs> I'll bet. Scary drive. Um, we've got Casey Dreyer, is that right? That's how you say it, yep. Oh. Dreyer. All right, good. Um, you can just cut that part out where I wasn't sure, Nicole, later on. <laughs> sure. We'll do it <laughs> yeah. in post. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> From the Planetary <laughs> Society. Hey, Casey. Hi. So Casey's going to come and talk to us about budgets. Trust me, it's going to be uh, terrifying and interesting. So um, <laughs> Mainly interesting. Mainly interesting. Um, we've got David Dickinson. Hey, hey. And we've got our uh, our chief, Nicole Gallucci. From I'm the chief West. now? You are. You're in charge. You're I, I pressed the video button. The one what herds all the cats. Yeah. Working on it. <laughs> cool. So, uh, so this week we've got uh, a bunch of news. We've got uh, an upcoming supermoon, a uh, audacious plan to uh, send signals to extraterrestrials, uh, a dust trap, uh, updates on the uh, budget, uh, sort of anniversary of Valentina Tereshkova. I should have this over here. Let's put this over there. There we go. Uh, an update to the Arcid Space Telescope, a launch of a Chinese rocket to the uh, Chinese space station, uh, a couple of cool images that we will we'll try and show, and the docking of the Albert Einstein uh, ATV-4 to the International Space Station. So uh, if you want to talk to us, uh, you absolutely can. There's a bunch of places you can do that, and this is where Nicole is going to be watching all of the comments. You can post a comment, question, feedback over on the event page if you're watching it there. If you're watching it in Nicole's stream, because she's the one who started the video, so you'll need to see it in Nicole Gallucci's stream, uh, you can post a comment there. If you're watching this embedded somewhere out on the internet, uh, you can just use the hashtag Space Hangout on Twitter. Uh, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can post a comment there. And as we always say, the safest place is YouTube. Because that's I don't know if it's it's. Uh, you know I. I, mean, I know it's it's all. Get crossed out. Those are the ones that randomly get crossed out sometimes on the comments. Do really? Do they just disappear sometimes? They, they show up and then they disappear. So yeah. I will be doing the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I will just look at the YouTube page itself and try and catch those. Okay. All right. All right. Well. So so we don't have a safe place. No safe no, harbor. There's no safe place ever. Place. There's nothing safe about this show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, cool. I'm, do I see them? I see some stuff on YouTube, so until they disappear on me. All right, yes. well, let's get rolling. Uh, cool, so let's start. Oh, what do I feel like talking about first? You know what? I'm going to let uh, Casey, our new guy, go first and talk about some uh, budget operations. All right. Uh, so we've actually just had something unexpected come out today. Well, somewhat unexpected, but it was leaked to Space News, and then there's another big issue that happened earlier this week, and both of these relate to NASA funding. So a lot of people know, especially if you watch this show, that NASA's funding has been kind of going this direction uh, for a long time. And within that, it's squeezing a lot of different programs internal to NASA. So NASA's broken up into these chunks that each kind of get their own honey pot, and then those are further broken up. So the Planetary Society, which I work for, obviously likes planetary science, which is, you know, they fund all the Mars exploration, outer planets missions, inner planets missions, anything not to the sun or looking out into deep space, anything going anywhere, essentially they, they fund uh, to our solar system. That part's been shrinking a lot the last couple years, even after big successes like Curiosity. We've been trying to re undo these big budget cuts to planetary science, and we actually did do that last year, that... They had requested a big cut. Congress rejected that big cut. And Congress, we were very happy with them this March, and they, they went and told NASA, here's your extra money for planetary science. NASA said, thanks, guys. Really appreciate the extra money for planetary. By the way, you don't really mind if we spend this on other things, do you? And they did. They went and spent it on other parts in the science division. They ended up cutting planetary just as much as we had originally feared and tried to stop them, and Congress told them not to do. 
This is what they did this in this budget document called the operating plan, which is a secret document that NASA makes and it, they report to Congress and they say this is exactly how we're going to spend your money. They technically have the legal ability to move money around as they see fit. They just tend not to do so because it kind of pisses Congress off if they don't spend it on the priorities that Congress tells them to spend it on. So the Planetary Society was very upset about this as a very unusual step. It was kind of felt like a, the rug pulled out underneath us. We thought we were done with 2013, and NASA kind of turned around and said, ah, suckers, you know, no, no, no extra planetary money for you, no funding for Europa, no funding for a future mission out to, to, to explore that moon around Jupiter or slower small missions is quite bad news. So Planetary Society is all kind of, up in arms about this, and that's where we have, uh, Nicole's going to be sharing a link about more details about this. Other things in the operating plan were good news. We had updates. They, they gave extra money back to commercial crew, which we really support. So the commercial crew's getting the money that they originally requested for this year. That'll keep that program on track. Uh, we also had enough money. They, they undid sequester to uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. So James Webb is getting the money it needs, strangely enough, coming out of the Planetary Society, uh, Science budget. A lot of weird stuff with that. The next big thing that just happened today, uh, which is the House, the the House of, uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to say the House of Commons, the uh, the U.S. House um, is releasing what they call the NASA Authorization Act. This sets policy. Every couple of years, they release one of these. This is the one that created the SLS last time they did this, the Orion Space Capsule. If these are big policy documents. They push the direction of the space program for the next few years incredibly important. This isn't exactly setting where the money is going to go, but they recommend where it goes and what NASA should pursue. And the big news that just was leaked today, it looks like they're going to release it next week, that they're not going to fund the asteroid retrieval mission that NASA would requested this year. So that's a big piece of news. And then they're also moving more money around. Earth science gets a big cut. Planetary science goes back up to a good level. And a commercial crew gets a middle kind of the road cut. So big issues in policy, big issues in funding coming down the line. This is not the last word on this. The, the Senate has to weigh in on NASA's Authorization Act. House and the Senate have to come and agree somehow. <laughs> They're coming from pretty different places. So we're going to be reporting on that a lot. But again, if you care about what NASA does in the future, this is incredibly important stuff. This is stuff you need to pay attention to and need to be in contact with your local politicians about what NASA is doing if you want NASA to do something different. So those are the big two things that are just happening this week. And so, I mean, that asteroid retrieval mission, I think a lot of people felt it was a great idea, a great way to, you know, learn more about these kind of potentially hazardous asteroids and also learn more about, you know, what it takes to actually explore you know, nearby objects, and now it's just it's just done? Like, let's just, is there any hope for it now? There's still hope, yeah. So, again, this is the House. This is just the House authorization. This is coming out of their committee that decides these things. They had zero Democrat, uh, Democratic support on this bill. There's an entirely Republican bill in the House. So the Senate is far more supportive of the asteroid retrieval mission. My guess, we haven't seen this document yet, my guess is that the Senate's version of this bill will include support for asteroid retrieval. NASA itself is 110% behind this idea. They've been trying to sell it very hard. They've been sending Charlie Bolden around the country, pushing the advantages of doing this mission. So this isn't dead by a long shot. Yeah, um, okay. Has anything new come out about NASA education funding? I know last week... Uh, while I was at AAS, they had the hearing in front of Congress about the, the president's restructuring of STEM, STEM education in the U.S. And uh, the bits that I were, was able to watch, uh, Congress critters were hitting pretty hard on why would you cut NASA EPO? Is any of that um, coming out of that document as well? Uh, the, nothing in the details that are public yet about this document. Uh, okay. We're, we're going to start to read stuff over the weekend. We'll get more information. And just to, to give background, in the president's request. So the president goes down every February or so and requests the following year's budget, the upcoming year's budget. Right. The 2014 request was that they cut back education, the division in NASA education, by about a quarter. They cut about $30 million from it. 
And they also the plan is to zero it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, yeah, yeah. for next year, they, they cut it, but fundamentally, they're restructuring how the government does education right. and moving things into the purview of the National Science Foundation, the Smithsonian, and uh, the Department of Education, I believe. And mm -hmm. it's taking it away from NASA's hands and giving it to kind of a more consolidated approach, which a lot of people are pretty worried about because yes. how well does the Department of Education know what NASA does? And, and, and the Smithsonian as well. I think the guy from the Smithsonian got grilled pretty hard in that hearing. Yeah, um, and so there's, um, in Congress, actually, there's a lot of hesitation about this, too, especially okay. with Eddie Bernice Johnson, who's the ranking Democratic member in the House. She's very worried about this. So uh, my guess, based on this document, that they've only had generalities released yet, and Space mm -hmm. News just released this today. My guess is that if no Democratic input was accepted or, or given, there, there's kind of these, you know, obviously there's these larger political issues happening right now in the U.S. Uh, where the, they're not working well together or at all, and so if there's no Democratic input, there may be no uh, change to that. However, one caveat, the funding for the authorization bill, they, they do give that money back. So NASA's education budget is bigger in the next couple of years. They approve a higher amount. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, the devil's going to be in the details, and this we'll have more information next week. Yeah, my assumption is just that all awesome ideas get cut, um, <laughs> and that's just the way I sort of you know manage my uh, my hopes and dreams. So Europa, stop being awesome. Europa's in there, so it's not all awesome ideas. Europa, they have they specifically say Europa Clipper. Let's go to Europa. That's a pretty awesome idea. Yeah, let's totally do it. That's absolutely going to happen. No chance that's going to get cut. Um, okay. All right, let's move on. Uh, so now let's, let's talk about a madcap scheme to send uh, tweets into space. And Nicole, now, so this is tweets the tweets to space. Tweets to space. This is the uh, the lone signal. Um, yes. And and this is where they're going to be, uh, uh, I guess, setting up a continuous signal from a uh, radio telescope. Yeah. And this uh, is uh, and uh, beam the, it yeah. towards. Was it? Go, go ahead, Nicole. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I, I, I'm just catching up on this story today, but it looks like, yeah, they want to send, this is known as messaging uh, extraterrestrial intelligence or, you know, METI or ACC, METI, yeah. that's what they're calling it. Um, and yeah, the idea is to have the public participate. They've got this big radio dish in California, which will be sent, sending this signal continuously. Um, where, I, I'm trying to figure out also where it's, oh, it's being sent to Gleesey 526. It's a yep. fairly close uh, star to Earth. Uh, they haven't found any definite exoplanets around it yet, but they're picking that and sending 144 character-based messages uh, out to the system in the hope of, of um, I don't know, getting a response or, or yeah, announcing yeah. our presence. Exactly, and yeah. The reason for sending it to, to a system that's so close, of course, is if it takes 17.6 years to get there at the speed of light, as radio is light, as I always say, um, and then it's going to take, you know, if they get the message immediately, you know, they, the uh, mysterious they out there, uh, it would take another 17 years to come back. And so, theoretically, you could have a conversation, a very short conversation within uh, <laughs> our lifetime if, if there's some kind of being out there. Um, it's not surprising to, you know, send these, ran you know, to use nearby stars for random searches, the very first SETI project. Um, um, Looked at a star that a sun-like star that was fairly nearby, you know, with the one of the first radio telescopes, and so that's not too surprising. Um, and you can, uh, if you go to this, the Lone Signal team, I'll be putting a link in the event comments in a second, um, is uh, where they are getting, they're taking uh, submissions. I don't know if there's a, I hope there's a screening process. As a lot of what's no, on Twitter think, really doesn't. No, I think they, well, no, I think you can you buy credits. Oh, you buy okay. Credits, yeah. and then once you bought your credits, then they'll transmit whatever you want to enrage, <laughs> our, to troll our right. you know potential alien overlords. So, <laughs> uh, so, so I'm gonna throw this a bit to Sandy here. You know, you work at a radio telescope. There must be some kind of protocol, like you know, please don't communicate <laughs> state secrets to our <laughs> potential alien overlords. Is that not in some? document somewhere? Um, it wasn't in the USRA handbook, but you know, I can go check the logbooks back from the yeah. 60s. Uh, I mean, there, there, a couple of years ago, they, uh, National Geographic was here with their wow signal, and they, were, they sent at least one tweet before the transmitter decided that it had better things to do that day. So, or it was trying to protect us. 
I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess if you're, you know, transmitting a string of zeros and ones, it shows that, you know, you're a vaguely intelligent society. But then if, uh, they, can, if they can translate that, I mean, assuming they can translate it into English somehow, then they're going to read the content of the tweet and realize we're not that intelligent. <laughs> right, okay, so let, let's, let's crack at this in two ways. One, is this even feasible? Like, if you fire enough power through a transmitter, aim it at a star... Would some civilization on that other star be able to receive this signal? Wasn't there an XKCD about this recently, about how <laughs> you know nearby stars are finally getting our, t <clears throat> excuse me, our TV transmissions from a number but of different But in that case, stars? it's you know it's it's being transmitted in a sort of in all directions as opposed to a focused beam. And I you know I'm assuming this that is the... yeah this is focused and and so you can dial up the power pretty high over a small p patch of sky. And so if they're looking. I, I don't know, I'm assuming they're going to use the 21 centimeter frequency line of hydrogen because they if any intelligent civilization's got you know doing radio astronomy, they're going to be watching that. Um, so so yeah. yes, you figure if you know 17 whatever light years away, if you were watching Earth, watching yeah. the sun, you would potentially be able to receive the signal. Yeah, or if you okay. do I mean if you're just doing an all sky, I mean we're, our radio telescopes are getting to the point where we're doing a lot more all sky our optical telescopes do. We're doing a lot more all sky surveys and so we can see transient events. We can see we can watch the whole sky for things that are blipping on and off um, and if you know our our signal could come up in one of them and because it's because it's focused at a star if you tried to spread it out in all directions that requires a heck of a lot more power yes, right. and you can't reach out as far right okay so now let's go with the second part of this is this wise it's going to take a long time <laughs> if we anger anyone for them to show up and uh, exact revenge or uh, so I don't know I don't plan on being around. around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are we? You know, is it a countdown till the von Neumann machines show up? To you know. Just... Oh well, that's what Phil Plato will tell you. It's not the aliens themselves. It's it's going to be the the you know like the Stargate replicators are, are, are colonizing the galaxy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because they can be through all kinds of of experiences. I, I'm I'm reading a book that brought up a very good point. Uh, spectrally, we've been broadcasting that there is life here for several hundred million years. You know, they can look and see chlorophyll and ozone and things that yeah. are going on that at least we know are elements that are, are chemicals that are only created by life. So we've been broadcasting passively for quite some time. That's true. But I think it's a lot harder to do that kind of spectroscopy. But, again, you know, yeah. again, the lifetime of a civilization. We're, we're almost at that point. They're yeah. talking maybe yeah. in a few decades. So somebody millions of years advanced probably can already look and say something's going on there. Maybe there's just microbes, but they, right. they may the know. Yeah, yeah. Send the berserkers. Yeah. I'm, I'm not concerned because the, the, the lifetime of a civilization is, is, I mean, if you look at the Drake equation, right, that's, that is something that Drake now says, Frank Drake now says, like, N equals L, right? That's his license plate on his car. Like, the lifetime <laughs> of a civilization is the most important thing to think yeah. about when figuring out how many of these civilizations we can actually communicate with, um, and, and the chance of finding one that's at the right pit place in time where, you know, they're not microbes, <laughs> and they are, um, you know, they care, I guess. We, we, have so to invent, we have to invent warp drives and the Vulcans will show up. So. Yeah, but I think, I think Dave is, go, is go right on the money here, which is that, you know, the age of the galaxy, the age is, is long, that, you know, if any one civilization appears, it should be able to completely colonize the galaxy within a mm -hmm. few million years with self-replicating probes. If it would have happened, it would have already happened. And, and that's so... the essence of the Fermi paradox. Yeah, you know, yeah exactly. Where are they? Um, yeah. So I think, yeah... It, Relating to this, uh, we're not we're not putting ourselves in any extra danger, as David Just, said. We've been broadcasting our oxygen and chlorophyll for millions of years. We're, yeah, <laughs> we're not right. putting ourselves in any extra danger by sending a few tweets. So it's merely a waste of time. No, it's fun. I know it's fun. No, no, absolutely <laughs> fun. It's just not going to be productive. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder okay. if one, once they invent their holodeck technology that they're just totally immersed in virtual reality and, you know, that's one Fermi doc paradox solution. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they don't care about reality anymore. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. Well, I think, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's fun. Let's, let's do it. And I wouldn't be that nervous about it because, as David says, we've already been broadcasting. Thanks, dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> thanks, microbes. Thanks, thanks microbes. Little yeah. jerks. If you need like another reason to invent antibiotics, <laughs> it's for signaling our presence here on Earth. Okay, Sandy, you're going to talk about an update to the Arcid Telescope, which we've been going on about week Ooh. after week. 
I am going to talk about an update to the ARCID telescope. So for those of you who just tuned in or have been living under a rock, ARCID is a crowdfunded project by Planetary Resources for the asteroid miners. You have one you know, group doing asteroid mining. It's a little bit of a nuts idea. You have two people doing asteroid mining. Suddenly it's an industry. So they've decided that first, before you mine an asteroid, you have to find an asteroid. So they're going to launch a little spacecraft, actually a couple of them, to look for asteroids to mine. And so what better way to do this than to get interest um, and people really feeling ownership of the telescope than to sell shares in it. So they have a project on Kickstarter. You can go find it if you search for ARKID, A-R-Y-D. It's a uh, reference to a Star Wars character, if I recall correctly. They're and just so shy of $900,000 right now. Just shy of $900,000 and just shy of 10,000 funders. Yeah. And so it'll be a little telescope that's going to look for asteroids. And they said if they can get to uh, $2 million, they're actually going to start looking for alien planets. So we all know that Kepler had some reaction wheel problems earlier this year, and I don't think actually Kepler is working any longer. Um, and so this would sort of be another um, sort of a follow-on to Kepler, another spacecraft that can be used to look for exoplanets through a couple of methods. And um, only for a mere million dollars. Only for a million million dollars. Is yeah, it looking well, for transits all tra transits all over the sky? If it was doing, it's going to be looking for transit methods. So the transit yeah. method is if you imagine you have a very bright star, and you are looking at this bright star, and then all of a sudden the planet moves in front of it. You'll see the bright star dip. And so if you're looking at this star before, during, and after the planet moves in front, you can say, hmm, there's something there. And then <clears throat> you can follow up with another telescope. The other method they'll look at is gravitational microlensing. So if a uh, star with a planet passes in front of a background star or something else, you'll actually see whatever's in the background sort of get distorted. And you can detect, uh, you can detect a new planet that way. So our, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, continue. So one of the ways that ARCID is uh, raising the planetary resources is raising money with ARCID is they're encouraging people to buy $25 space selfies. So you can I take a photo. Of <laughs> I did. I, I know it destroys my journalistic integrity, but I totally bought one. <laughs> you <laughs> have, no want a photo I have no integrity. I have no, I have no journalistic integrity. No, go space. It's the 21st century, right? Go space. It's cool. Um, so what they'll have is a little LCD screen on the spacecraft where they'll, and then they'll have a camera behind the LCD screen. So they'll take a photo with that camera of the LCD screen of the spacecraft and of Earth. And you'll see a little bit of space from that. So that's kind of cool. You know, the selfie culture is a pretty big deal this, these days. I don't know if you follow Tumblr or, or on Tumblr or Instagram, but everyone's taking photos of themselves. So what better than to have a selfie in space? <laughs> I'm going to send my Google Glass self selfie to space. There's, uh, but there's gonna come it, a... It'll be a couple of years. It's not going to, you know, when the Kickstarter is funded or not, it's not like this is going to happen tomorrow. It's, and the $2 million isn't going to cover the cost of the spacecraft. They're doing this as a way to build interest, to get people involved, education, public outreach, um, and I guess also raise awareness. To develop it. Yeah. You have to pay people to develop it. You've got to buy a rocket. You've got to launch it into space. They are tiny bunch of engineers. I think they got $2 million from uh, uh, Seattle Museum of Flight to help oh, them great. reach that. So they're, this is on top of the two million they've already got. You'll, yeah, know, when all the, you'll know when all the selfies get released because everybody will change their Twitter icon. <laughs> and Twitter icon and <laughs> yeah, Facebook exactly. icon and LinkedIn. Yeah. But it's if the ultimate at... marriage of the modern age, right, where you, you, these things have only existed for not very long. Space and the kind of narcissistic self-pick that everyone takes and posts on the Internet. Those are two it's... very new concepts. Yeah, and it's an epic background with, you know, the Earth behind you. So it's, it's See, that's, very that's meta. that's an actual correct use of the word epic. Yeah. So, uh, and then now, the stretch goal is exciting, but if you go to, like, websites like KickTrack, they raised a quarter of a million dollars on the first day and the second day. But the average amount they've raised in the last, I don't know, 10 days has been closer to $15,000 a day. So I really hope they make their, their stretch goals because it would be great to have it look, uh, our kid look for exoplanets, but mm -hmm. don't hold your breath. Well, at this point, I mean, they've got 16 days to go, and they've still got $105,000 to go as well. I'm, I'm hoping they make their minimum number at this point. Me too. I mean, well, they only they, raised $7,000 yesterday. Yeah, so they're going to so they, need another boost of, uh, of marketing and promotion, I guess. Um, okay, oh, no, Casey, I know you have... space hangout boop. Oh, yeah, yeah can I, um, there you go. Casey, you've got to go, right? I know, yeah, so, I so, so thank soon. you so much for joining us. Thanks for bringing the budget and, uh, yeah. and making us all sad.
I wanted to <laughs> add a couple of comments, uh, especially for uh, Guido Bieber says, Casey, new guy, we love the crossovers between Planetary Society and Cosmo Quest Universe today. Me too. So, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Great. Uh, also, we've got a couple of other comments I am uh, catching up on. Uh, Stark RG on YouTube says, um, NASA's budget's already such a tiny amount of the old overall budget. I don't understand why they're fill fiddling with such small changes and not worrying about larger portions. So that's commentary on the budgetary process in general. Um, and also, Guido Bibra, who is in Germany, says that the planetary exploration should definitely be an international stuff. Writing to Congress critics is a good idea, but, you know, he's in Germany, doesn't not quite the same, um, but uh, this is something that to be worried about with other countries as well, to contact, contact your local leaders um, and say that this is important to you. You want me to spend a quick minute on both of those comments, or do, sure, do we need to can. move on? Yeah, uh, first of all, for international people, that's a, a really great point. So on the Planetary Society, we do offer ways to write. You don't have as many options. We write the president and also Charlie Bolden, just mm -hmm. to kind of get that international aspect to it. The biggest thing, though, for people, especially in Europe, is finding ways to support ESA and the, the European Space Agency. Because the European Space Agency does amazing planetary missions. You're seeing stuff like uh, Rosetta going to happen next year, hitting, getting up to that comet, where they're going to go and explore Ganymede in 20 years, but still they're going to go explore Ganymede. Bepi Colombo going to Mercury. They make really... Mars Express is 10th anniversary of Mars Express this week, too. They do really amazing stuff. There's... The, the budget for, for planet for all space science in the European Space Agency is something around $600 million a year. This is, that's just the astrophysics division within NASA. So they do a lot for very little money. Mm -hmm. So working, living in Germany, living in Europe, working to get ESA funded better, or the science within ESA, not just using it for technology and, and engineering, that's a great step. And one of the things that's in our future is to expand into more international politics. Should also say China and India are having some pretty exciting planetary missions happening this year. We'll talk about those some other time. There's a lot of international stuff going on with planetary exploration. The other thing with NASA budget, as always, the problem. The, ha the, the penny for NASA movement is a great idea. A penny of every tax dollar going to NASA, 1%. Right now it's a little less than half. Of course, Congress doesn't necessarily work by logical, rational means a lot of the time. And uh, the big problem is, is that you're dealing with two very different caucuses in, in politics right now, people who really want to spend a lot less money on government, and this is what you're seeing in the House. It's trickling down to say, all right, well, they, they passed something that slashed the overall federal government by quite a bit, especially spending, general spending accounts. That trickles down to say there's just less money in the pot to give to NASA even though NASA actually does pretty well in the House authorization, considering there's just a lot less to work with. So once the, the total kind of raises, you can bring it out of the sectional kind of divisions. But really what it is, once people start writing to Congress, writing or calling the representatives, not even about any particular thing, but just saying, come on, guys, let's explore, let's go into space, let's pursue science, then it becomes easier as a general rule. So getting awareness up and getting general, you know, positive feelings... I think most Congress people say they maybe get one letter a month about NASA. They get 100 letters a day about Social Security. Which one is untouchable? So, yeah. <laughs> so that's just a way to... So we got a lot of work to build a constituency for space, and that's what we need to do fundamentally. This won't be a problem in the future. Cool. Well, we'll, we'll keep uh, being good proponents for it. And Thanks for joining us, Casey, and I Happy know you've got to run. Uh, yep. So we'll see you later. Maybe see you in guys. a future week. Thanks. Okay, bye. Uh, I think there was a good segue about international space projects. Well, actually, there was the uh, the Chinese launch, which That's I wanted it. Amy to mention. That. <clears throat> I don't nice need. To, I, nice. I can segue anything into anything. I can go <laughs> two I stories together, no matter what. But. <laughs> um, yes. There is a new Chinese mission that launched this week. Um, I have I have fewer details about the actual launch um, than I do about the mission. So if anyone has launch details, like throw them throw them in. But um, so this was the um, it's the Shenzhou. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Shenzhou Ten mission. Um, it is three cosmonauts or taikonauts rather. Um, the second female taikonaut is part of this crew, and um, what this crew is doing is they're actually going to go spend about 15, 15 days. Um, or maybe it's 14, given, 15, given the... Uh, 15. Is it 15 full days? Yes. Um, on the... Uh, I'm going to pronounce this one wrong, too. The Tiangong-1 
prototype yeah. space station. Did I pronounce yep. that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so they're they're up there. So this is the prototype space station that China is hoping to sort of use. It's kind of like a, a docking testing vehicle and a sort of learn how to live and work in space vehicle because China has been denied access to the International Space Station in large part by the United States. Um, so they don't they don't have that, but they want to have you know, a foothold in space. So this is part of their sort of building up that base. So uh, this mission has taken some pretty good steps towards that. Uh, the Tiangong one <laughs> was launched in 2011. It's been up for, for almost yeah. two years. And um, this crew did, uh, they did an automated docking, so they didn't physically take control. Uh, the Shenzhou spacecraft docked with it on Thursday, yesterday, and um, during the rest of the mission. The crew's inside the space station now. They're going to undock from the station and do a couple of manual docking tests um, just to prove that they can do it. And um, then they're coming home. And so is Tiangong-1. The space station's going to come down. They're going to deorbit it in two or three months. They're sort of, oh, I, I, I haven't, I have, yeah, I haven't seen a date, but no, I keep no, no, seeing no. references to before the end of the year within a few months. So um, that kind of suggests and... Um, yeah, that they've got something else in the pipeline going going up, presumably to fill that void because they've had this space station and been using it as a target for a while now. So we'll see what what happens next. But they are taking some. I mean, they they only launched their first manned space flight in two thousand three. They're doing pretty pretty quickly, all things considered. I mean, yeah, given that their their space program had a false start in the the fifties with um Soviet technology and never went anywhere and then got a second start in eighty six. And that's the technology that's kind of carried them forward this far. So it'll be interesting to see. And I um I haven't seen an update on the mission today, but yeah. Place your bets. That's Amy. What's happening. Do, you think, do you think uh it'll be Chinese Chinese footsteps first on the moon? Returning um, to the moon? I don't know. Um Quite That's, possibly, given given the way NASA's funding and yeah. the SLS Orion is going and the lack of clear plans, it's also sad. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. C yeah. They, they seem to have a, like, the Chinese space program just seems to have a plan. They have their goals and they seem to be, I mean, they're doing what NASA did in the 60s, which is like, we have goals and we're going to meet these goals and here mm -hmm. are the goals. That's how you, you know, succeed with things in general. Right. So, and, yeah. you know, to have a, you know, totalitarian government that can make sure that those goals are met. <laughs> Definitely helps. Yeah, it really okay, does Okay, so it's help. more like the Soviet Union. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here's, here's the, the uh, crew eating in orbit. Oh, very cool. Nice. Got, they've actually got a couple photos. This is from uh, Amy's, Amy's story. Oh, great. Well, I mean, it's great. It's so great that they, I mean, they've, that it's great that there is another space station up there. It's great that there's another sort of way that this is happening. And if they, you know, if the first ones to walk on the moon, that'll be awesome. I'm, you know, as a Canadian, I have, you know, no skin in this game. <laughs> CCTV is a pretty good source of uh, daily information on what's English language source of uh, videos and info that's going on up there right now. I usually check them once a day while they're up there, so. Yeah. So Hugo Burnham is asking, why has China been denied access to the island? Um, summarize the political blech around <laughs> sharing with China. I I haven't actually ever read anything sort of uh -huh. by the United States saying this is why we don't want China in the U.S. But it it comes down to political differences, and they don't yeah. want to. Um, I don't think it's as much work with so much as um, money go to. Yes, that's, that's been my <laughs> understanding. Yeah, I'm trying, when, when I'm trying I read, to think of the right words here. Yeah, to sort of. When I read NASA and NSF words. documents, they they put a lot of stipulations about um, working with with Chinese yeah. collaborators, and no money can go to a Chinese uh, yeah. institution when you do so. So, yeah, there's and yeah, and this isn't just ISS. I mean, this is across the board. I've read some oh, stuff yeah. on planetary missions, and I mean, unmanned robotic stuff. And they're like, no, we can't give any money to fund Chinese investments. And yeah. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not sure what the deep deep roots are. I can imagine it's deep deep political roots, yeah. but yeah. Amy, I have a question. Uh, have you have you ever gotten any grief about using the word Tycho not? Because I know I have. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I haven't because I usually yeah. put in brackets have, the Chinese term for astronaut. Have, have uh, you seen the arguments though on Twitter about no. about uh, it's it's uh, no, it's it's one of those terms I guess is I I use it I say Tycho not I think it's they, fine. Yeah. All the all the stuff I've 
read about it from China, English language stuff uses the term Taikonok. Yes, I, I've had some people get in some very spirited discussions with me about it's not really a term. Or <laughs> spirited <laughs> discussions on the internet? Yeah. Never heard <laughs> language? <laughs> wow. All right, well, let's move on. Guys, go Chinese. Um, uh, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, you know what? Let's talk about the supermoon. Yes. Oh, Superman. Next, Today's the release of yeah, the new The Man Superman. of Steel. Man of Steel is coming out, but that's not the only thing that's super this month. We actually have the closest full moon of the year. And actually, it is the technical closest moon of the year when the moon reaches perigee on the 23rd. The, not this Sunday, this weekend, but the, the next Sunday after that, we're actually going to have a, a perigee or proxygean or super moon, as the internet likes to say. So It's a perigee syzygee. Syzygy, yes, the, they're, they're all going to be lined up. The, but, of course, we have that twice a month, twice, twice a synodic period anyway. Uh, astronomers kind of, I don't know if you'd say dislike the term supermoon. I, I think perigee moon is a little more accurate. Um, but the Internet seems to have breathed new life into it. It, it kind of was born in a, astrological circles a few decades ago. I think that's where, the, uh, where people are kind of at odds about. Like Taikonaut in Blue Moon, it's one of those terms that supermoon likes to start arguments on the Internet. <laughs> I think we need to claim that word. I think science needs to get it back and use it, so... Like, like here, here's the supermoon sizes. I love this. Yes, this, this yeah. was, Can you tell the difference <laughs> without was, the lines this, there? This was shot by an amateur astronomer over in Karachi in Pakistan. And what I think is interesting, those two Im middle images, we were, uh, me and him were talking about this too, One, they were on the same night. He shot these in successive nights, but the two in the middle were shot on the same night. One was shot when the moon was on the horizon, and the other one was shot when it's overhead. And you're seeing a difference somewhat from refraction. We're talking about the moon illusion, where, where the moon actually, uh, people will say it appears psychologically larger, but you'll notice that one that's brown on the, when I'm looking at it here, it's my left, your right. That one, refraction actually works to make the moon smaller when it's on the horizon. So the moon illusion is actually a little more of a psychological illusion than people think. But another thing you're seeing when the moon is on the horizon, the moon is actually half an Earth radii more distant than it is when it's overhead. So a lot of people think the moon looks larger on the horizon, but it's actually a tiny bit more distant. When you think of you're sitting on a sphere, and when it rotates, the moon when it's overhead is about half an Earth radii closer. So you're mm. seeing a little bit of that, dis di that difference juxtaposed to that image as well. And uh, so, so what's the date that we're going to get this at exactly? Uh, June 23rd is when the moon is at its, it's going to be, looking at my almanac, it is going to be 356,991 kilometers from, from very center distance from the, the common very center of the Earth. Now the moon comes almost as close every anomalistic month, every 27.5 days. I think that's another thing astronomers kind of roll their eyes at the supermoon because they're like, well, we reach perigee, it's not that unusual really. It's, uh, we reach perigee every time the moon goes around. And, and, uh, and in this case, right, the, the moon and the sun are on opposite sides of the Earth at this point, so we're not even getting the combined gravitational yeah. effect yeah. of the it, two of them. So per Perigee isn't always near uh, full moon. Yeah, it just yeah. happens to be... Co full moon is only an instant. Full new moon, first quarter, last quarter, those phases, they're only an instant when the moon is at 180 degrees solar longitude from the sun, exactly opposite. The full moon always rises opposite when the sun sets, but it's only an exact instant in time, and then you're into waning gibbous. So, so there's all that other nonsense, all that astrological nonsense, you know, people going crazy, uh, I don't know, bad luck, earthquakes. Yeah, the, the earthquake thing raises a lot of controversy, too. I've already, with posting on Universe Today, once again had this debate with people. Yes, about, I love uh, it. I love it. The perigee full moon causing it's it's in, as long as people stay on the topics, you know, it's it's an interesting discussion. There was a Taiwanese study in two thousand three that kind of breathed new life into the full moon causing earthquake thing. Uh, they found a very very weak statistical signal. It's not a compelling study. I've read it before. Uh, you would think the full moon would cause some kind of earthquakes. I mean, it causes higher tides. We're going to see proxygean tides and things like that. But uh, earthquake triggers are much more complex than just having a simple, like, moon overhead kind of event. Right. All right. Oh, well, this let's... is cool. Guido Bibris just sent me an image that he did between April and May of I've this year. I've seen a lot year. of comparison images, too. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to... Oh, I 
creature. Super moon. Super moon. So he just said oh. that. Oh, so <laughs> Guido is Guido's pitching for embiggened moon. Yes, he's pitching moon. for embiggened yeah. moon, and <laughs> yeah. this is his uh, his I images of such a thing. We use yeah. that term in the in the virtual star when, party quite a bit. When you steady the motion of the moon, you realize actually how complex it is. And something yeah. I didn't realize till a few years ago is that. The, the tilt of the moon is actually locked to the ecliptic. It's not locked to our rotational equator. The moon is tilted about five degrees to the ecliptic. Most satellites aren't oriented that way. Most satellites are, are tilted permanently as a permanent tilt to the, the equator of their primary planet. So it's kind of bizarre that the moon does that. Mm. Uh, well, let's move on. Um... Actually, well, let's keep talking to you, David, just briefly uh, about the uh, the ATV docking to the International Space Station. Yes. We've been talking about this last week, and so yeah, there, about how you could see the sky. Been, there's been a lot of dockings and undockings, progress undocked recently uh, off the uh, port of the Vesta module in ISS, and it's making way for the ATV-4 Albert Einstein, which is launched by ESA uh, last week from French Guiana. And it is going to dock tomorrow. It's in the 9.45 a.m. EDT time frame, which uh, on GMT is like uh, plus 4, 13, 45. Within a few minutes of that, I, I don't have it in front of me. But NASA TV is going to carry it live at starting at 8 a.m. tomorrow, and I'll be up live tweeting and watching that, and that will be yeah. another So who, if you wanted to see it, like with your own eyeballs... Um, I'm just trying to think about the time. So you'd probably be in Asia, maybe Australia, right? Where it's going to dock, I haven't looked at the predictions yet. I, I usually look at that once a day. It's been um, it's been a few minutes behind the ISS, but that they're probably doing some orbital burn, so that's going to change. Uh, if you've got ISS passes, it's worth watching maybe five minutes before and five minutes behind. Uh, later tonight, I'll probably look because UK. Uh, Adrian Westo over there, Virtual Astro, he's usually tweeting a lot of ISS passes, and I usually feed it because UK gets a lot this time of year. Yeah. Because they're at the correct We're getting a ton. I'm getting, I'm getting yeah. one every couple of nights now in Canada. Uh, I will look in a few hours and probably tweet it out on at Astro Guys, like how many okay. minutes in front or behind the ATV is. But you can see that would be really neat to see them both at the same time. And, and uh, Progress is still up there too. Progress just undocked, but that's still going to be up there doing a series of radar experiments for about a week. So yeah. there's three things in the ISS orbital path right now. Yeah, that'll be really cool. Yeah. Gotta get some pictures of that. Um, now, Nicole, you've got a story about a trap. It's a, a trap! trap. <laughs> okay. You just want to yeah. say that, right? What? It's a trap. You just want it's to be able to say that. Trap! Yes, um, so this story came out during the AAS meeting uh, from one of the press conferences, and this is from my, I, I, I'm going to say it, my new favorite telescope, ALMA, uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, um, which is in the Chilean desert. Um, this was a, an early science proposal that was done to look at a young star that probably has planets forming around it. Um, and the, the, the uh, question is, how do these planets form in particular? Um, dust grains... Uh, when a star is forming, there's this disk of dust grains around it. Dust and gas and stuff. Uh, ices, when you're, if you're far enough out from the star. Um, and there's a problem with the models for planet formation. And how do you get these little dust grains to actually stick together rather than blast, you know, blast themselves apart when they hit? Um, and so this was a candidate because it had a, a dusty disk around it. Uh, and there seemed to be a gap being formed by uh, a large planet that was already starting to form further out, so some gas giant probably. Uh, but they found this little uh, crescent-shaped feature. Um, I can go ahead and try and screen share that in just a second. Um, this little crescent-shaped feature that they saw with the millimeter wave telescope. Uh, there it is. So uh, they colored it blue because, you know, you can pick whatever color you want when you're using a radio telescope, really. And this little crescent turns out to be a sort of dust trap. This feature around the star is where um, you uh, can build up that's uh, gravitationally interacting such that they're moving slowly with respect to each other so they can clump together and form larger and larger bits that will eventually form a planet or asteroids or a Kuiper Belt type thing. Um, and so this trap allows the, the dust grains to actually stick together and form a larger thing. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the press release came out with this mystery dust feature, uh, but I know, I know the press officers at the NRAO, and they, I, I know they probably wanted the title to be It's a Trap, and so they made the embargoed password at the time. <laughs> 
it's a trap while it was still under embargo. And so I felt it was okay to go ahead and use that title when I wrote about it uh, <laughs> because we're all, we're all geeks here. It's all good. Uh, so that's another um, result to come out of Alma when it uh, was still running with just a few telescopes on the mountain is seeing the details of planet formation to an extent that uh, we, haven't, we haven't ever seen before. So Alma itself is going to gonna finish uh, putting antennas up there this year. They're almost, they're almost there to, to uh, full sensitivity. Uh, so one last story I think we have time for, uh, although we did start a little bit late, and that's Amy Sure title going to talk about women in space, 50th anniversary of uh, Valentina Tereshkova. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll keep it really short. So this weekend we're celebrating 50 years of women in space. Uh, on June 16, 1963, uh, Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman in space. She was the pilot of Vostok 6 which flew in tandem with Vostok 5. It was the last two missions and the last sort of, well, the last sort of joint mission, I guess, of the Vostok program. Um, it was a, a pretty simple mission. It was three, three days in space, I think 48 orbits. Um, some sort of minor science experiments. Um, but what's really interesting about Tereshkova and sort of the, the thing that we kind of tend to ignore when we celebrate women in space is that she was launched as um, for politics. I mean, she, this was the time when the Soviet Union just wanted to do anything it could to gain, you know, a one-upmanship on the United States. And, you know, they got the first man in orbit, they spent the first day in orbit. And Sergei Korolev, who was the Soviet's chief designer, kind of, I mean, sort of equated a little bit to as uh, kind of the Soviet version of Werner von Braun. Um, he, he was looking at all these sort of big things that they could do to stay ahead, and one of them was this joint mission um, where you just sort of launch two things at the right times so that they just kind of cross in orbit and keep on going together, and the other was to launch a woman, and the idea was to showcase that the Soviet system valued its women as much as it valued its men, and to give Soviet girls the idea that they could rise up through the communist system and become, uh, you know, national heroes, astronauts, or cosmonauts rather, whereas little girls in America at the time couldn't because NASA was drawing all of its astronauts from test pilots, which excluded women. So, so Tereshkova goes up and she becomes this massive hero. Um, and I mean, she's, but she has really been speaking out about women's rights and sort of equality and, and sciences and has been working in the sciences her whole life. Um, but it's pretty indicative that it was 19 years before another woman flew in space. It was 1982 that Svetlana Savitskaya, I think is how you say her name, if I'm remembering it right. Um, she flew as the Soyuz T7 crew, and that was a year actually a little less than a year before Sally Ride became the first American woman in space. So less less 50 years of women in space than 30 years of women in space, maybe. <laughs> right. but, um, so they like checked off, checked yeah. it off the list and then went <laughs> and back to men. Well, there, there, were, there were plans for... So Tereshkova trained with five other, or four other women, rather, and there were plans to have them launch on other missions, but whether it was because it was Korolev's plan and he actually died in 19... I think early 1966, um, or because they just... I mean, they kind of fell out of the moon race around that time um, and really backed off the manned space flight stuff. None, none of those women ever flew. The, the female cosmonaut trainees were sort of dissolved quietly in 1969 and didn't yeah. have any women in space for 19 years. So 30 years of women in space. <laughs> but now there's women in space all the time. So Yeah, yeah, because, you know... That's what should happen. It's all that's what should happen, <laughs> and and more women in the weekly space hangout because yeah, that's... they just wanted to say, ladies be comrades. Um, so <laughs> I want to bef before we get into, yes. we're going to talk a bit about the upcoming um, the CosmoQuest Hangoutathon, which is going to be starting up tomorrow. Oh God! Uh, watch Nicole go crazy. Oh God! That's <laughs> on, happening tomorrow for you. <laughs> on the internet, uh, but before we do, I just want to show one really cool picture, and then uh, we'll get on with the. Uh, shameless self-promotion. So uh, so this is a picture that was just released a couple of days oh, ago yeah. from NASA SDO. Now, now this is a, it, it's an eclipse, but what, what it actually is, is it's an image of the sun from NASA SDO, which you can see is the one on the back. And then a couple of times a month, SDO sees a version of eclipse, but of course, you know, the moon is passing in front of it, and so it's seeing it completely in shadow. But what's really interesting is just along the, the edge of the moon, there's all these mountains and craters that, that you can actually see, and I, I don't know if I can sort of zoom in ah. and hold the... Yeah, it's not really going to hold it on this Holy image. Holy pixels. I, I need a bigger, I need a better, higher resolution image of it. Um, 
But what happens then? The folks from the the lunar record, uh, the LRO data, lunar mm -hmm. reconnaissance orbiter mm -hmm. uh, data, they went and dropped in a moon and aligned it perfectly to sort of have the the mountains and craters match up with what the uh, was what the with the eclipse that STO normally sees, and so you got this really neat composite image, and uh, and I thought it was just a really wonderful picture that they had they had put together. Now a lot of you know we posted a lot of people like you know that's not possible, and like obviously it's not possible. It's yeah, it's, a it's art, people. <laughs> it is yeah. art. But it, it shows the ori it shows the orientation of the moon at the time that it, it passed over. It's a composite, but yeah, I yeah. saw the image, but I hadn't read the article, so it's kind of like when I saw the image, I was kind of like, huh. So I was like, <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, as soon as it goes on Reddit, someone's gonna the first comment will be shopped. Shopped, shopped, <laughs> shopped yeah. Well, and I'm, you know, I'm, and I am the worst for that, but, you know, because like people are always posting these images of like, you know, it's the North Pole and there's like the moon and yeah. the sun and they're the wrong size and you know and like what a could you actually no it's fake or this there's this one of like the Milky Way behind the planet and nope totally photoshopped so you know I. I'm the worst for this, actually. I go out and just ruin people's days. You're that guy. I'm that guy, yeah. Uh, oh, that's totally shopped. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's now let's talk about the upcoming uh, Cosmic Quest Hangout-a-thon and let people know how they can do this. And also, um, Sandy, we're getting some echo from you. Oh, I'm just going to dance over here. Yeah, okay. Nicole, go. Okay, so CosmoQuest is doing a Hangout-a-thon. It started as a 24-hour event. It's now a 32-hour event. Um, as we are trying to fit all the amazing people in who wanted to participate. This is, uh, in large part, a fundraiser for CosmoQuest. We are looking to ra raise $200,000 uh, over the course of this event. This will keep us um, going for six months while we retool our um, our funding plans. Of course, the sequester and the all the STEM education reorganization has hit us pretty hard, and so we are shifting gears in how we fund the project, and so we need a little help uh, to get through that. We want to keep our programmers fed and paid and, and fed, because <laughs> they're amazing. And without them, there is no Cosmo Quest. Uh, so that is, uh, if you can help out, any donation is, is helpful. No donation is too small. If you can't donate money, that's fine. There are lots of other ways you can help. In particular, you can share the event. You can share the cool stuff we're doing. If you like a show of ours, comment on it. Share it with your friends. Um, so there's a lot of that. The show itself is uh, going to be full of guests um, from Fraser and the Star Party to uh, I think Phil Plate's going to be involved at some point. Uh, we have a um, we're even having a Cosmo Quest community hour early on Sunday morning. A couple of you guys I've I've reached out to who are you know always here in the hangouts with us commenting along. Um, we're going to have you actually in in, in the hangout with us. Uh, we've got a bunch of scientists. We've got uh, my favorite infrared camera demo. My friends at UVA are doing again at three in the morning. Uh, Amy's going to be talking about space history. Sandy, I know you're. I don't remember. <laughs> I can't hear you. I muted, muted her. She I muted, muted her. You gotta unmute yourself. Sorry. I can't hear her. But I know we have. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, we just came off like a week and a half of observing, staying mm -hmm. up till like 7 a.m. most nights. So this is the first time I've been coherent at 4 p.m. in a while. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll get back to you and I will see if I okay. can get a 100 foot Ethernet cable to f in the vicinity of any cats. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Sonny's going to bring us cat vision. Um, Pal and I are going to do some fun demos. We have videos coming from all over the world. Uh, we're going to be doing cooking and crafts, anything that's astronomy related. Oh my gosh, I can't even keep track. There's a so lot. So where going on. can people find out about this yes. to to schedule their weekend? So go to cosmoquest.org and you get there's a little blue bar up the top and it says the hangout on outathon is here and it's got the schedule, it's got the blog post about it, it's got the donation link, it's got the link to everything there. Um, the the videos will be coming up on the event page from Cut for Cosmo Quest. Uh, but just go to that little blue bar there. Um, I could maybe screen share that in a second. Uh, and that'll have all the information that you need. Let me do a quick screen share. Okay. Ta-da! So yeah, so right here, CosmoQuest.org. You see that? Join mm -hmm. us! Uh, so background, the schedule. Uh, in the background link, uh, we will have the links to the videos and little bar. We've already got people donating. We haven't even started yet, and that's fantastic. And cool. we love you. Yeah, and Pablo and I will be awake for pretty much all of it, so you get to see us uh, slowly <laughs> lose our sanity. <laughs> That'll be the best part. Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be fun. 
I just right. can't wait for it to start because all the prep has been a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. I'll <laughs> Sleep stuff is so much fun. Yay! You can pretend, you know, it's like an observing run that just yep. never ends. Never ends. I've yeah, done that. Yeah, we're going to be doing this all on uh, the, using the Google Hangout technology, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, we're using Google Hangouts. And I know Google they're Hangouts. limited to like four hours, I think, yes. so you're going to have to break it up into a bunch of pieces. And We have a list of events already for every four hours for the first 24. I think we'll have to add some more. Um, but there's yeah. one major event. I'll share the link out in the uh, comments that has the links to all the other events. <laughs> Great. All right. And I will see you tomorrow as you put me to work for various hours across this whole thing. So that'll be fun. Uh, great. Okay. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody, but also how do we find out more? So, Sandy, where do people find out more? You can find me, Sandy, on Twitter. Uh, and that's pretty, much, that's pretty much where I am. You can ask me questions about radar and I'll answer them. <laughs> Yay. All right. Amy, short title, now that you're in your new home, writing again? Yeah, now that I'm finally back to work. Um, I am still at Discovery News, Motherboard, Device, Al Jazeera English, uh, Scientific American, and Twitter, uh, ASD Vintage Space, and you can always read my blog, which I haven't updated in a while, Vintage Space, and Google Plus is a good place to find me. Awesome. All right. David Dickinson. I am still Astro Guys with a Z across the blogosphere, and I'm writing for Universe Today, Lestisor, Canada.com. And I am a wannabe science writer and science fiction writer, and I am out under any dark sky that you might, if it's clear. Sweet. And Nicole, of course, the noisy astronomer. Noisy astronomer. Uh, postdoc with the most rock at CosmoQuest. Uh, I write for Discovery whenever I get a chance, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, CosmoQuest and Skeptic, and on my own blog at noisyastronomer.com. Awesome. And my website, of course, is Universe Today. You can find that at universetoday.com. And uh, the next thing, I guess, is going to be the... Your, is 11 a.m. Central yep. is when we start. So yeah, and that's going to subsume all of our uh, various activities over the weekend. So I don't think we'll be doing a virtual star party okay. per se. It's going to be part of the hangout. So. Okay, good to know. That's yeah. fine. Well, are you guys doing astronomy cast? You think you're gonna poke Pamela awake on Monday? Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do climate change. I think on astronomy cast. Okay, awesome. When she, when her brain is most malleable, and I can ask her really tough questions. Yay! Okay, cool, awesome. All right, well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everyone for participating, and we'll see you all next week, and some of you tomorrow. <laughs>